Hola, buenas. Eh, buenas tardes. Vamos a empezar rápido para evitar que aparezca el hambre. Intentaremos ser también directos. Eh, antes de empezar, me gustaría recordar eh, que la conferencia de James va a ser en inglés. Entonces, tenéis en la aplicación del, del evento eh, un botón que pone traducción simultánea. Si le dais, vais para abajo y podéis elegir la traducción simultánea en español o en inglés. ¿Vale? Eh, Ah, bueno, quien no tenga auriculares, nos recuerdan que en el que, en el, que, que hay en el mostrador. James, si you want, or... it's, it's okay. okay. It's okay. Yeah. Eh, bueno, eh, la verdad que estamos muy contentos de, de tener aquí a, a James Binning. Él es miembro fundador del colectivo Assemble. Es un joven y asombroso colectivo de artistas y arquitectos londinense que entre otros muchos reconocimientos ha tenido el, el premio Turner, que es como la referencia de, de los premios artísticos en, en Inglaterra. Más allá de todo ello, eh, estamos muy contentos de tener a James aquí. Siempre en el comité académico nos interesó su presencia, sobre todo por tres, por tres cuestiones, y que creo que está muy relacionada precisamente con el debate que se está estableciendo en en estas jornadas. ¿no? La primera es que es por su imaginación para transformar lugares inusuales o lugares periféricos o incluso, diría, residuales en auténticos espacios públicos. Y tiene que ver con esto precisamente que comentaba Almudena, ¿no? de crear nuevos espacios de relación donde no se los esperaban. ¿no? Eh, la segunda cuestión por la que está Assemble aquí hoy es por su capacidad para construir estos espacios a partir de procesos democráticos y de co-creación. Es decir, abriendo el proceso no solamente a la gestación de las ideas, sino a la propia construcción material de los proyectos. Y, y esto es muy interesante porque una de sus grandes singularidades es precisamente cómo llevar a la materialidad la expresión de todas esas eh, individualidades o de todas esas experiencias comunes. ¿no? Y, y finalmente hay otra cosa que no, nos parecía muy interesante del, del trabajo que vienen realizando Assemble, es que no prestan atención especialmente al objeto, al proceso constructivo únicamente, sino que van más allá y tienen una preocupación eh, muy grande por el uso de los espacios, por la creación del programa de actividades culturales, eh, como una parte esencial y creativa del proceso. Entonces, digamos que es una de las cuestiones fundamentales que están aquí porque eh, de alguna manera se insertan o dialogan con muchas de las cuestiones que se están hablando previamente. ¿no? Y, y que tiene que ver sobre todo con que los espacios públicos en donde ellos intervienen terminan siendo no lugares para el consumo, sino lugares para y por eh, la producción, para la relación. Uh, James, thank you for coming. Uh, very impatient for you. Thanks very much. Um, could I just get the first slide up? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a bit today about how we're we're kind of organised as a group, um, as Assemble. Um, we're a practice, as I'm sure um, Sergio said, based in London. Uh, we're slightly unusual in the way that we're structured, um, in that we're a cooperative. So it's a kind of business which is owned by 15 partners, um, and anyone who joins in the future will also take ownership in that company. So fundamentally, it's set up as a sort of shared ownership model. Um, and predominantly, we, we're trained as architects, but it's quite a broad and, and kind of interdisciplinary group. Um, and that, I, I think, is important, enabling to operate in a slightly vaguer way, maybe, than and, and working across um, typical professional boundaries. Um, so sometimes that's working in a capacity as artists, sometimes as community organizers, um, sometimes as architects and more kind of clearly defined professional roles. Um, but the work that we produce and the way that we try to sort of talk and think about architecture, maybe outside of the normal professional boundaries of conversation, 
um, take quite a few different forms. Um, exhibitions and, and kind of research and thinking about how that research is communicated is a really important part of our practice. Um, this is one example of that. It was a, a piece of uh, work that we did with the Royal Institute of British Architects thinking about um, the kinds of quite risky um, and ambitious play environments that were very common in public housing projects in England in the 1960s and 70s that were often then removed and demolished um, as they kind of fell out of favour and were replaced often by much less risky, um, more prescriptive uh, types of play environments for children. So in revisiting, we thought some of the very interesting kind of pedagogical um, ideas that were embedded within these kinds of structures about how kids might explore and use the city as a learning environment, um, thinking about a way of making that kind of more active than just uh, kind of passive within a regular gallery context. So remaking these structures in soft foam so that we could sort of see how people would use them differently um, to kind of contemporary play environments. In the first part of our, our career, um, we, we used temporary structures a lot, and I think really only because that was the, the kind of extent of the means or the resources that were available and the time frames that we were able to work with as relatively young professionals. These were the risks that people were willing to kind of take on us in a way. Um, but we think that those, those projects can be very useful, although you know, often they've become um, synonymous with more kind of commercial uses of, of urban space. Um, they often also offer opportunities to think uh, or take greater kind of risks or ask different questions that aren't typically possible within um, more formal processes of commissioning within the built environment. Um, so in this instance, thinking about how a, a new theatre structure um, for an out-of-town theatre on the south coast of England might consider the landscape around the theatre as part of the landscape um, or part of the kind of theatrical infrastructure of the city rather than just making another kind of closed theatre and how that might be a more kind of democratic and open way of thinking about performance. Um, so temporary is a means of asking kind of concrete questions which might reframe the wider development agenda around a particular um, kind of question. Um, and I think often our projects certainly uh, kind of the earlier ones focused also on trying to identify and utilize underused spaces or spaces that were outside of the relatively well-defined and conventional ideas about what has economic value in the city. Um, so spaces that are often created incidentally by moments of infrastructure development, um, spaces which a regular developer or a local authority might not see potential in or a kind of realizable value in. Um, and those things are often... Uh, open to maybe more reimagination or reinterpretation, and we're quite interested in seeing those as sites where um, there's more possibility to act and to do things um, which are maybe uh, less prescribed or um, a bit more open and negotiated uh, within within urban contexts. We've always been very interested in, in resourcefulness uh, and trying to take things which are kind of part of the fabric of everyday life uh, and try to think about how we can invest um, kind of visible care and uh, attention in the detail of the way that things are made from those materials. So I think we find the kind of material characteristics of much of the built environment as it's made today um, very difficult to uh, decipher. You know, like it, it's not easy to see in the fabric of many buildings today, how they're made, all the processes are very difficult to read. And that's very difficult, uh, very different from the historic city. You can see in the units of bricks that go together to build up big structures or large stone blocks. You can read a kind of hierarchy of economy and culture in different kinds of building, and that's increasingly difficult, I think, in the, the environment today. Um, so we're very interested in, in sort of working in a way which maybe reveals some of the process and skill and ingenuity of construction again. Um, and makes these buildings, um, even at enormous scale, feel much more kind of human and relatable and made. Um, and I think we're also interested in the, within the process of architecture generally um, as something increasingly industrialized and difficult to, to work with um, and, and kind of unconstruct as a process. Um, architects increasingly are sort of left to design the envelope of buildings from industrialized components. Um, and actually, that gives you very little agency or control maybe over the final um, feeling or character of a building, particularly public buildings. We think that's an issue. 
Um, and so we're quite interested in trying within our practice to identify areas of the project which are quite critical and to reclaim responsibility for them. Um, so within our practice, we have a building company and we do quite a lot of fabrication as a way of trying to take some of the informal ways that we worked on earlier temporary projects and think about how that translates to a more methodical and rigorous process um, where we can still have a level of control and authorship uh, in the realization of larger, more ambitious public projects. So in this case, for a recently completed gallery in, in Goldsmiths in South London, um, where we kind of took all of the external cladding out and, and built that ourselves. Um, it was also cheaper to do it that way than it was to work with a contractor who wasn't familiar with more complex processes. Um, but I'm going to talk about just three projects today, and each one try and explore a kind of particular idea. Um, I think all of these quite closely correlate to the theme, um, or the themes that have been discussed maybe in the previous conversation as well. Um, and the first is the idea of the city as a tool, not an artifact. Um, and I think we're quite interested, although maybe we would disagree with many of the ideas or, or sort of theories of, of Buckminster Fuller um, and his kind of worldview in some respects. I think um, he talks a lot about synergy and the ability of uh, the coming together of a number of individual parts to create something which in the whole is greater um, in their combination than the, the individual parts themselves sort of suggest there might be the potential for. Um, and we find... Uh, that's a kind of analogy which exists across you know, a, a number of different scales and situations, um, but it's particularly relevant in consideration of something like uh, an adventure playground. Um, and this project was located in the east uh, part of Glasgow, which was an area being extensively redeveloped um, at the time of the Commonwealth Games in 2012. Um, so this whole uh, kind of area, this district of the city, which was quite run down, and according to lots of... Um, kind of multiple indexes of deprivation. Um, there would be very high levels of child poverty, very high levels um, of unemployment, very low levels of life expectancy and these kinds of um, issues. And whilst the Commonwealth Games offered a sort of long-term perspective of, of positive transformation for the area, um, in the short term, or a kind of 10 to 20 year, 20 year lifespan, um, that would create an environment which was in constant change. Um, and for sort of successive generations of children would kind of grow up in this landscape that was primarily defined by site hoardings, uh, construction site and noise, um, and in, in some instances also the, the situations that children had been playing in, which were very poor quality play environments anyway, um, were completely replaced and demolished um, to make way for car parks that would, would kind of uh, be a, a kind of support infrastructure for the, the game's development. Um, and within this landscape, it became very clear that children in particular were, were sort of excluded uh, or were going to suffer the long-term effects of this, this change. Um, and we were very interested in the, the post-war movement um, and, and the ways in which many, many uh, kind of children were going out in the period after the Second World War, particularly in London and, and other cities in Northern Europe, um, and playing amidst the bomb sites of the city and, and finding that to be an extraordinary sort of educational um, an open environment in which they could sort of learn and negotiate their social relationships. Um, and thinking about uh, the capacity of these kinds of environments, which are very open and loose in many ways, um, to support a totally different kind of uh, like world building um, and education to the kinds of environments that we typically use to, to sort of... Uh, put our children to play in, in much more controlled ways, these swings, slides, these quite didactic um, environments. Um, this was particularly relevant in the context of, of Glasgow because having removed all of the playgrounds, many of the children were breaking onto construction sites um, that were very good at keeping out adults and people that might go on to try and nick materials, but very bad at keeping out smaller children. Um, and so in a sense, the project um, had a very kind of clear idea, and a very simple idea, which was to take... Um, another site, which was currently unoccupied in this area, um, and divert some funding that was made available for the, the production of a sculptural object to celebrate the games, and instead to just take a lease on a piece of land um, which could be made into a safe space for children um, to come after schools and in the school holidays, and divert materials that were being taken off the construction sites onto this site um, to recreate... Uh, the kind of possibility and the set of tools and resources that were available on these construction sites that kids were finding extraordinarily exciting but quite dangerous environments to play in. 
um, and creating something which was still quite risky, um, still very loosely defined and still very child-led, um, but negotiated that risk in a, in a slightly more socially acceptable way. Um, and so aesthetically, it looks like very little, or certainly did for the first six months. Um, really, it was a site full of wood chippings, construction, you know, excavated earth, um, and in some cases, uh, kind of big sections of pipe that were being laid into the ground. Um, and so it's hard to kind of make aesthetic claims for a space like this and to value it on the terms that we're familiar with valuing most of the city around us. You know, if it looks good, we sort of generally perceive it to be good. Um, and these environments are very, very different. You know, they're, they're kind of constantly changing. Um, but that lack of preciousness, I think, actually also creates an immense kind of imaginative potential um, for children on these, in these kinds of spaces and environments to constantly make and remake them. Um, and over time, this organization has kind of grown up um, and sort of matured, and we've put in place a slightly sort of more formal infrastructure around it. Um, we, re we, we sort of secured a longer-term lease on the site, uh, set up a charitable trust to kind of secure the funds in an ongoing way to make sure that having set up the playground, it continues to act as a, as a sort of simple community resource. Um, and also established a kind of clearer set of principles and rules. So from giving children access to all the things that we have in our own workshops, saws, drills, um, and kind of trusting that they can handle those things with enough judgment and responsibility that they're not going to hit somebody with it or, or kind of accidentally cut their hand off. So give, give a lot of responsibility actually to the children to determine their own boundaries rather than impose boundaries that we feel like are um, maybe ones that they should subscribe to as, as young people. Um, we've also set up an artist residency program, so um, rather than us kind of having an ongoing heavy-handed role in the production of the space um, and its development over time, um, we've tried to create a looser infrastructure into which lots of other people can come and work with the kids um, to sort of develop new elements of the playgrounds, which again, some are temporary, some are more permanent. This is a, a kind of climbing wall which conceals a, a shipping container which contains a lot of the tools and the basic infrastructure. Um, and so over, over time, it's kind of constantly changing. It goes from muddy fields to kind of greener pasture um, in the summertime. But there's always these quite ambitious and abstract um, structures being made. Um, and, and over time, there's a, a sort of constitution, I suppose, that's developed for the playground, um, which establishes a basic set of principles or, or rules, um, that it's always a child-led space, that the, the play workers that are in that are responsible for looking after the kids don't set an agenda each day. Kids come and go. Um, they can participate or not participate in things as they please. Um, it's unlike every other environment in which those kids experience um, where an adult is making decisions on their behalf, and that's a very important kind of principle of it. Um, and children are even, in, you know, if, if something does go wrong, then it's up to the children to determine what the kind of punishment or um, consequences should be for other kids, you know, that they have to take responsibility for their own social relationships with one another. Um, so it's a very simple project which began as an art commission um, where we proposed not to build an object which would edify the, the kind of games, but to, to make a very simple um, kind of piece of, of play infrastructure, really, that over time has grown um, from a small community of initially 40 kids to around 350 kids a week that regularly use it. There's over 1,000 members um, within the local estates that, that use this playground in the summer. Um, and it's also been able to kind of more clearly define the role that it would play. So from a simple brief initially of making a sp play space for kids, um, it now serves free school meals in the summer holidays. So in poorer parts of the country, um, kids going to school will get a free school meal, otherwise they might not get a hot meal that day, um, where families are below the poverty line. Um, outside of school holidays, that doesn't happen, um, obviously, because the kids aren't going to school. So the playground has had to kind of pick up that responsibility. And so over time, its kind of remit has expanded from just a place to play um, to something more representing a kind of a, a piece of social infrastructure in the area. And as that's happened, it's become important to to sort of put in place um, mechanisms to make sure that it continues to operate and it doesn't fail. Um, maybe unusually, we're still very involved even five years after setting up this organization. So we sit on the board and have an ongoing role um, in the kind of management and development of the site and thinking about how it might replicate or how some of the principles that are applied here might be taken to other, other spaces. 
Um, so this is a kind of summary. It was initially 200,000 pounds, so about 225,000 euros. Um, it's established as a charity, and it, so it does need regular fundraising. Um, it's totally free for kids to go um, to the playground. There's no kind of commercial barrier, and it has no commercial uses that sustain it. So there's never a question on any day of the week about whether it's private or public. Um, it's always open to anyone that needs the resources there. Um, I think the second project I'm going to talk about quite briefly um, is, is Black Horse Workshop, which is something we see um, as uh, a new kind of, or slightly different kind of resource maybe to traditional uh, kind of workspaces and um, yeah, kind of productive spaces in the city which are often more transactional in the same way that traditionally our health service is something that we have a transactional relationship with. We go and we expect to receive a service as kind of consumers. Um, and I think we're interested in the potential for building up simpler infrastructures that are more relational, um, where as well as being somebody that receives something, you can also contribute something. Um, and that through that kind of simple addition of lots of different uh, experiences and, and skills, you can build up something which has the equivalent complexity and ability to, to sort of respond to um, a demand or a need. Uh, as some of these larger and more centralized and more bureaucratic and increasingly cumbersome and, and unwieldy um, kinds of institution. So this one's in Walthamstow in North London. Um, and we conceived of it sort of in the, in the spirit of some um, similar types of spaces that came before. Mechanics institutes were something um, that was kind of driven by the ideology of uh, John Ruskin um, and kind of sort of rooted in the arts and crafts movement. But the idea of, of kind of workers um, free educational collective establishments, um, but also informal spaces like men's sheds, um, which are quite an interesting, um, very simple, practical spaces for elder men in retirement age to come together and, and, and do practical projects, um, but also provides then a context for other issues that affect that demographic um, to be addressed in a more informal environment. So often social isolation and, and kind of mental health issues as well as physical health issues. Um, and so this project was working with a council in North London um, to take ownership of an empty warehouse space and think about how it could be uh, both a kind of hybrid of an industrial workspace and a more genuinely kind of public uh, resource, accessible like a library might be. Um, and so it's a sort of entry-level space for anyone from um, kind of school groups to DIY makers or hobbyists um, as well as hosting a community of professional makers. So there's a sort of full spectrum across there um, on the basis that there's an increasing demand for the kind of making um, uh, a kind of knowledge and skills as people become maybe more distant from those kinds of things in the world as we experience it and the products we buy um, and in the jobs that we do. Um, but, it, but also to see that as a, as a social practice and not just a kind of uh, hipster craft um, kind of occupation and increasingly concerned with the production of relatively high value objects. Um, and that's become quite a diverse uh, organization, I think, because of that mix of community that it, that it quite deliberately um, fosters. Um, so unusually high numbers of uh, kind of women members um, and people using, or women using it, um, women professionals using it as a platform to, to run educational programs. Um, quite an unusual demographic in terms of the, the kind of schools and local audience that it kind of brings in and works with, um, and also a lot, of, a lot of young people. In the UK, over the last 10 years, there's been quite a lot of cuts to design education in the UK. Um, and often, um, technology and engineering courses and things are, are kind of emphasized above practical kind of making. Um, and so actually, places like this provide potentially quite a valuable infrastructure for enabling schools to continue to offer those programs affordably. Um, but because of its location as well, it sits um, sort of on the, on the boundary of an industrial estate and a residential estate. It has this hybrid character um, of something which both has a, a kind of public life and a light industrial use, um, which again is quite unusual. Um, the organizational structure of, of the workshop is uh, very light. It's a kind of low overhead model. So there's one director and two technicians who provide the kind of practical expertise. Um, and then it really acts as a platform for this broader community of professionals to contribute their skills, to run courses, short courses, 
one-off evening classes on how to make something. Um, and so really, its, its resource or its offer comes from the community of people that use it. Um, so the more that it's used, the, the more um, kind of diverse, I guess, and plural the set of things that it, it offers is uh, able to be. Um, and that's, I, I think, been quite successful, actually, for a very simple and, and relatively cheap-to-run operation. Um, so yeah, this kind of combination of a very public element with um, a more substantial community of professionals. And typically, I guess, the logic is that those two groups don't want to coexist, or there's no value for a, a professional community to work in a more public building. Um, it would be inconvenient, their space would be encroached upon, and, and in our experience, that's just not the case. Um, and so over time, again, what began as quite a simple organization has gradually expanded out um, into uh, something genuinely more industrial, but also more public in nature. So it's become kind of more extreme in its two, um, the two kind of elements of its life, I think, which has been quite successful. Again, we've been involved in this in the longer term. So rather than as an architect that kind of completed the project and then um, sort of that was the end of our involvement, we're still involved on the board level in this project as well. So we have quite an ongoing involvement. Um, and this is a simple summary of that. So again, a very small original investment of £100,000. Um, initially, that funding was for two years, similar to the, um, to the playground project. Um, but it's now been running for six. Um, and again, thinking about how it starts to not expand and scale, but replicate and, and sort of share um, the basic principles that underpin it with other organizations in other areas of the city. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit now, I don't have a huge amount of time left, it goes very quickly, um, about our work in Granby, which um, I think is a way of uh, trying to conceive of the city as something which is open and indeterminate and ongoing um, as a development process, rather than a kind of closed and tightly prescribed thing. Um, and so Granby is an area of Liverpool which has been subject to uh, huge amounts of uh, kind of contentious planning and, and kind of political and social tension over the last 30 years, really since, um, since uh, a, a period of kind of civil unrest in the 1980s. Um, historically, it was a very, very diverse community, which um, traced its roots back to the time when Liverpool was one of the largest metropolitan cities in the world, with a population of over a million, um, and an incredibly diverse population as a result of its kind of history and connectivity with um, international trade. So it had one of the oldest black populations in Europe, um, but in the 1980s, that kind of all became uh, very contested within the Granby area. Lots of difficulties with the local authorities and the police, which culminated in um, some very explosive riots, after which the council moved all of the social tenants in the area to other parts of the city to kind of quell, um, to try to sort of dissipate the, the, the growing unrest. Um, and so from an area which historically had sort of 800 residents uh, and was incredibly mixed, it was reduced to 50. Um, and then successive generations of, of kind of master plan um, ideas sought to demolish the housing in this area and rebuild at a lower density. So to turn quite a dense urban neighborhood into something more suburban. Um, and the resulting character was this. Um, so houses and streets which were left completely abandoned, which were, were kind of almost militarized or very aggressive in their the kind of treatment of this, this urban environment. But within this context, um, on the four remaining streets of the original 14, residents that lived here um, began to extend very simple domestic actions out into the public realm, so kind of painting the shutters and the, the fronts of the houses, um, and reclaiming really the streets, um, and so spaces which were traditionally maintained or had been maintained by the municipality um, or the council, were, were kind of abandoned, the council stopped collecting bins, and so the residents kind of took on all of these responsibilities and more. Um, so th over time, this series of very DIY and small scale actions, really individual scale actions, kind of building up to totally recharacterize and re, um, redefine the feeling and atmosphere of the area, and also the, the, the ownership boundaries between public and, and communal. Um, and at the same time, initiating uh, kind of broader projects like uh, a monthly market to bring people back into the area to sort of challenge the media perception um, of the space as somewhere which was uh, kind of off limits or had no, no future. So these kind of played an important part in both rejuvenating the commercial life of the area 
um, of the high street had died when the, some of this master plan had been kind of realized and the, the high street was cut off. Um, so these temporary markets were a very important way of, of sort of reclaiming the narrative about the area's future. Um, and so we worked with the Community Land Trust, who had sort of formed around these 50 residents that had been um, in the area for quite a long time um, and had been very active in their resistance um, to the council's plans to demolish and rebuild uh, to come up with a very simple plan to reuse the housing that was there in very poor condition, but also to come up with a strategy for the public space uh, and the commercial life of the area, which kind of built on these incremental scale actions. So a long-term and gradual strategy for growth and renewal rather than um, to taking a step back and sort of putting a flag in the ground for 20 years down the line about a kind of comprehensive vision for how this area would be imagined. Um, the houses were the first parts, and so we managed to get a transfer for, of the houses from the council to this organization which put them in trust, so in shared community ownership rather than in individual ownership for the long term. Um, but the budget for the houses was very, very small. Um, so they had to be very, very economical um, with the way that they, they kind of reused these shells, which were often in very, very poor condition, as you saw in this, this kind of image. Um, so around 50,000 euros a house really was the sort of budget for, for each of these. Um, but within that process, I guess after 20 years, the residents uh, had sort of aspired for slightly more than the lowest common denominator refurbishment of some houses. Um, we also tried to think of a broader opportunity um, for reinvesting um, some of the, the kind of material um, richness and, and kind of cultural uh, creativity that had begun the characterization of this neighborhood from somewhere which was quite aggressive and militaristic um, into something much more domestic and unruly and kind of cared for. Um, and so we set about producing a set of domestic objects. So if 95% of the budget was extremely economical, then we would use the other five to create um, these very focused moments of kind of care and attention within the buildings. Um, these are just some images of the, the houses once they've been moved into. Um, but really critical to this was the idea of, sort of breaking down the formal relationships between the contractor, um, the community that was, was kind of driving the change, and us as the, the kind of agent. Um, and so we worked in one of the single terraced houses um, where the meetings took place in the front and we were occupying the back. Um, yep. um, and, and really turned that into a kind of factory terrace, a kind of workspace um, which could be used for the production of these domestic objects in quite a public and visible way. Um, so making processes which would typically have an off-site kind of much more visible in the context of, of the neighborhood. Um, and an important part of that was the production of these mantelpieces using the kind of waste material from various different houses. Um, so kind of recasting lots of the material that uh, was sort of around and sort of represented the kind of demolition and decay of the area in something kind of more optimistic at the center and the heart of each house. Um, and thinking about trying to, to sort of build up again on this Small network of small-scale actions that had driven a much bigger process of change. Um, we set up an organization in the area called Granby Workshop, which was a way of kind of formalizing um, that kind of culture of DIY creativity. Um, and I ran an open call to kind of bring a lot of different people in to produce um, a range of products for an exhibition, a public exhibition alongside um, the, the Turner Prize, which the project was nominated for during the course of the project. So it wasn't for the finished project, it was for the process of the work. Um, and a bit like Baltic Street, a very simple set of rules um, about how each uh, kind of project or, or, or product um, should enable kind of variety and chance in its creation um, and not sort of instrumentalize or create sort of dull mechanical work for people in the production of it. Um, and so this really began, uh, this was the, the installation in the gallery context. So this was the launch of the business um, in Granby, selling all kinds of domestic objects um, that over time has led to the, the development of Granby Workshop as a, a kind of piece of local infrastructure. So we are still the directors of that organization, but in time uh, it will transfer to community ownership um, and be a fully owned business that's kind of owned by the Community Land Trust and that can be an agent in the ongoing development and renewal of the area. Um, and so from making quite a wide range of products, it now focuses primarily on, um, on ceramics. It recently produced the world's first um, range of, of fully recycled uh, products made only from waste material, so waste slip from kind of toilets and things like that, um, and these kinds of things. 
Um, there are another sort of set of family of ongoing projects in the area that are all of similar scale, um, so that each of them sort of takes stock of, of the changes as they happen and then proposes a kind of a next step. So it's quite a gradual plan. Um, some of the houses that are in the worst condition are, are impossible to kind of reuse economically as a house. Um, they would be unaffordable if we were to turn them back into a residence, um, offer opportunities for bigger pieces of kind of shared public infrastructure. So in the case of these two houses, knocking them together and turning them into a public garden, which extends this kind of informal planting and, um, and gardens that were made on the street, combined with a residency space for artists, so that, that it won't always be us that are there kind of as an ongoing contributor and collaborator for the, for the land trust, for the community, um, but there's a kind of rolling cast of artists that can come in, be supported in the long term to work in this way, um, and that this kind of culture of DIY creativity, which initiated the renewal, um, is kind of more formally supported and allowed to continue. Um, and so that opened a couple of months ago. Um, this is it. It's got a bit of growing up to do before it looks as spectacular as the picture. Um, and then finally, um, the kind of commercial renewal. Um, so we've recently put in the planning application and got some funding to think about how to scale Granby Workshop um, and introduce other kind of community-owned businesses into the area that can also become kind of valued employers, um, opportunities for training of young people and things like that in the area. So this kind of incremental renewal of the, the town is gathering momentum around a kind of distributed network of um, community-owned projects, essentially. Um, so that's a bit of a summary of, of, of that project um, as well. Uh, and the final thought, I think, in all of these projects, really, is that quite key to them is that the idea of shared ownership of the development agenda, whether it's in the playground um, or the workshop or in, in Granby more roundly, um, what's important, I think, is that private and public and civic roles are sort of reimagined and re renegotiated um, to kind of make the space for something which is small scale, um, often involves multiple stakeholders, and through the kind of aggregation or accumulation of lots of small actions can achieve complexity. Um, rather than trying to, to sort of assemble whole, uh, you know, more centralized and large-scale holistic solutions to, to of, often kind of complex problems maybe that um, planning isn't able to deal with. So, yeah, bit of a whistle-stop tour through three projects. Um, but, yeah, I'll, I'll be around for the afternoon if anyone's got any more, more precise questions you want to have a longer conversation about. Um, but, yeah, thank you very much for, for listening. Overrun a little bit. Great. Um, Thank you. Well, thank you, James. It's the lunch time, but if anybody wants to, to do any question. I'm sure you're very hungry, but happy to hang around for one or two if there are any. Well, then we continue the conversation in the lunch time. Thank okay. you too much. Thank you.